All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you uh, for joining us for our webinar, Consumer Electronic Devices Using Simulation for Structural Integrity, Thermal Management, and Electromagnetics Design. Um, I would like to uh, introduce our presenters, uh, Dr. Arindam Chakraborty, who has a PhD in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Iowa and a master's in aerospace, uh, aerospace structures from IIT. He has more than 12 years of academic and industry experience in solid mechanics and design, nonlinear FEA, fatigue and fractal mechanics, reliability analysis, composite structures, and uh, in industries including oil and gas, nuclear, automotive, aerospace. Uh, he is uh, the Vice President of Advanced Engineering at BIAS, and his email is listed on the screen uh, if you need to contact him for any reason. Uh, we are also, um, uh, we also have Eno Tanjong from Deso Systems, who is our presenter as well, and Eno is currently a Senior Solution Consultant with Deso Systems Simulia, where he serves uh, a lead technical role in supporting pre-sales efforts for value solution clients and partners. He has over 12 years of experience in simulation software industry gained after uh, receiving a BSc and MSc in Electrical Engineering from the University of Massachusetts. Uh, we also have our um, experts here, Dr. Shrikant Shiviraju, who is the Director of Technical Software Services, Jim Reed, who is our Technical Director of Electromagnetics Applications, and Glenn Larson, who is our Senior Katia Application Engineer. Um, and these uh, guys will be helping us out at, uh, at any, for any uh, questions that you guys have at the end. So um, this webinar will be about an hour long, and um, first Arindam will uh, do his part of the presentation, and then Ina will present his, and then we'll have a Q&A session at the end. So if you guys come across any questions during the presentation, please feel free to ask us, and we'll be happy to help you guys out. Uh, with that, let's get started. Um, Arindam, would you like to start with the introduction? Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Kaniz. And uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Um, this is Arindam here. Uh, yeah, I'll quickly quickly talk about our company and then I'll, I'll introduce uh, some part of the DSO system solutions and talk about a particular case uh, which we, we, have, we have taken from a consumer electronics device product. Uh, therefore, which some uh, simulation-based uh, design has been performed. So hopefully it will give you an idea of a, how to solve a practical problem, not just talking about software can do this and that. Uh, so I will present the initial design part of it and all, and then I'll give it to you now for the electromagnetics part, and then I'll come back for the thermal and structural part of it. And as Kani mentioned, we have our panel of experts available. So if you have any question, uh, so Jim is uh, uh, will be able to help you from the EMAC side, what we do and all, and how we can help as well. Uh, and then Glenn will be from the KTI. I can talk about the abacus and CFD structural part of it. So moving on to the next slide, which is sometimes not easy. Okay. Company overview. So first what who we are i mean as a company so we we started about three and a half years before uh, just a couple of us uh, started working together build up this company so now but what we what we started is we are a the source system a value added uh, a value added reseller so we do add value while selling their software to the companies uh, small and medium sized companies and we started with Simulia. We moved on to uh, Katia, Dell, Miano, Via, and 3D Experience. So we sell the entire entire solar spectrum of their software solutions. And when we say Simulia, it's not just Abacus. It's also iSight, FeSafe, and Tosca. Uh, so we have some some example here about uh, using iSight, uh, and we can discuss more about it. And we have posted a lot of videos and all from uh, our company presentation. So feel free to watch those. Yeah, and if you have any question, we'll be able to help. It's not just the webinar topic. Uh, one thing we were very, uh, very cautious from the beginning is we wanted to make this company as, with multidisciplinary industry experience. So we have people from all across different industry domains, as you can see the names there. 
and of course uh, including high tech and all uh, so we started in houston now we have expanded into other cities most of our members have a uh, phd or master's degree they have done their thesis work and have expertise in certain areas of application many of them come from software background uh, so like Srikanth, he has been on uh, the source system support manager for more than 10 years and, and all of us have uh, have the experience of using the software for a long time. I have been more on the consulting space and all, uh, but using Abacus, uh, Abacus and other resource solution for a long time. Uh, we provide engineering consulting services, software sales, of course, and then training. It can be customized or out of the toolbox training, standard training. And also we help with a lot of automation and customization. So if you have a problem, you think you need help with automation or customization, we are always there to help you. These are our overall technical capabilities. Uh, I'll probably a little bit go faster on this. We have quite a bit of slides today and we'll also want to keep time for the question and answer. So we have all the breadth and depth of different services that we can do, including, of course, analysis and all, but we also do design optimization, reliability, uh, a lot of simulation automation. And as you can see, also, we are getting into the digital mock-up uh, place and also uh, trying to get into more data analytics application where we bring in the physics from the software solution and also the data actual measurement data so if you have any any interesting project in mind let us know our value proposition as a software solution partner so we are we are very client focused uh, committed to their success their success is ours uh, we have the domain knowledge so you you can see us as a one stop shop so when you come for one problem maybe i mean problem doesn't depend on the solution right so it, we need to look at what solution can help the problem so in our team if you come to us we have all the all the different uh, solutions uh, experts from different solutions and physics so we can tell you what will we what needs to be done to help you and what's uh, what software may be right for you and how you can use them and all uh, we you can review your existing simulation workflow or processes and provide you a feedback uh, on, on improvements and work with you on that as well so not just handing you over the software but helping you maximize your utilization uh, as I mentioned before, we provide trainings, customized and tra standard trainings. We do all the introductory trainings pretty much and also the advanced training. We are right now training at Boeing for all their US needs for Abacus and also uh, if uh, if you have any like groups, sort of a t group that you want to train on to something, we can do very, uh, so very customized I and mean, catered to just your need, those kind of training. And uh, we also help you utilize the fullest extent of your software's power with subroutines and automation and everything. So uh, do let us know. As for today's agenda, uh, we'll get into the uh, technical part of it now. Uh, so we'll talk about, uh, we'll introduce uh, the high-tech industry applications uh, using the source system software. We'll talk about the platform, which is 3D experience a little bit. Then we'll talk about the BME example. It's a smart projector. So where, where you have the projector as well as the speaker in the same box. And I, at my home, I have a similar one, uh, not exactly BME, but I can see the value. The, it's, they are really trendy and very, very useful. Uh, we'll talk about then the conceptual design that we have taken for, for this workflow. Uh, then, you know, we'll talk about the antenna design and the placement, and then I'll come back to discuss structural integrity and thermal management part of it. Finally, we'll open up for question and answer. And uh, maybe we'll not get to all the Q&A, but if you have any question, you will be able to uh, contact us directly at any time. So high tech industry nowadays, I mean, everywhere uh, you, you will see the industry around us. Like every, everything is becoming high tech. Like we don't uh, realize, but all our components and all even something like a refrigerator, you will see a lot of electronic components and all of display board and everything. So, and they are also getting more and more connected, smart and the mobility, mobility is also increasing. So all this, uh, whenever you, you, you bring in new value, it comes with new challenges as well. And that's where, uh, that's where we have the task, right? That's where the product development companies, consultants, software solution providers, they have this task of how to make sure using the right physics, uh, bringing in the right, uh, modeling the right behavior, uh, right test data and all, but how to make the product perfect because it's full of challenges. I mean, we say, okay, it can do this and that, but uh, we have to solve the problems uh, on our way. Uh, 
So it's it we have to look at. I mean, it's full of different mechanical components, sensors, and data and software is there. Connectivity is there. So for today's uh, discussion, we are more uh, we are more focused on the physical uh, components of it, and we'll talk about that. And sometimes one of the thing uh, we see here is things are getting extremely complicated. Uh, extremely complicated. So it, it's important that we we capture the interactions because intuitively, uh, when things are very interactive and complex and nonlinear, intu intuition based design and all, it's it's good to start with. But most of the time, it may lead us to get to a design which may not eventually work. Uh, so one one design good for something may not be good for something else. So with this solution, this overall, and I will talk in a second. Uh, this brings to the point of 3D experience platform. Uh, it is all always important to understand the overall interaction, understand the variability, and all. So we'll touch upon that today. Uh, these are just some of the examples of what we made or make things of. Uh, like for example, automotive, right? I mean, it, it's uh, full of electronics component. Almost, I think, 80, 70, 80 percent of the cars are mostly electronic components right now. So, getting into the platform now, as I was saying, I mean, there are a lot of dots that we need to connect. There, there are a lot of things that one design stage uh, we face it, but then when you go to the next design stage, some other problem may come in. And it's very, very difficult to collaborate and very difficult to bring in all those physics, uh, manage, manage that product development process. And also time is of, uh, of essence. Nowadays, you want to be in the market faster as soon as possible, but with the right product. You don't want to hurry it and get a wrong product because that will put your company back maybe a couple of years, right? And it's a reputation problem as well. So there comes the 3D experience platform. It's a multi-physics and based on science. So as you can see here, and I, I'll not get into the details of this there. Are, I mean, it can be a 30 minute slide by itself, but as you can see, there are, there are functional requirements. There are logical requirements. So, so the, for all this on the 3D experience platform, there are software solutions available. So you can do a system level logic test and everything. Then you get into more macro scale continuum model which is FEA and all the same. We have a micromechanics model. Then you can go even deeper and deeper to the material science aspect. And then the on the micro scale and below the non-continuum. I mean, we'll probably limit it to say right now, functional, logical, physical, and to some extent, the material science related. Uh, so 3D experience platform gives you uh, the interaction. It connects all the dots, but it's also about the collaboration. It's also about the checks and balances. That's where you will start seeing uh, the value of using this platform. And we do uh, we do offer uh, we do uh, we do uh, help with you uh, help you with the uh, 3D experience platform sales and uh, to understand the value of it. Also, you can do it on cloud. And also, if you have any question, we'll probably can. Uh, talk later on, but think about it, how you can use it, and maybe we can have a conversation. So getting into connecting data, discipline, and people. So this is extremely important. So you have the design, you have the science, and all manufacturing, and then finally the market. I mean, sometimes you, you develop things, you do a lot of these analysis and all. You can use a similar tool because you are making the model of your device and all this thing. You can bring that for your marketing purpose as well. So there are, I mean, it, it's probably related to uh, how much you can dream of. There is possibly a way to solve, uh, help you with your dream. So I'll, I'll put it in that way. So Bimi is a smart projector. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it, it shows an example, nice example of how the consumer electronics is, uh, industry is becoming, actually it's becoming smaller, portable, more innovative, user friendly, and aesthetics and everything is there. So at aesthetics is also a big part of it, right? Uh, so it's a smart projector example on how we will show you how we create this product experiences, bringing together the various disciplines that need to be uh, encompassed to design this and also the various engineering challenges. So getting to my next slide, uh, you can see what are, what are the many different components of it. So we today we are going to touch on some of the CFD, FEA, and electromagnetics. But uh, see here, the, all these components and all, it, it constitutes a lot of interdisciplinary engagements and a lot of science, a lot of, lot of different scales even, right? So that's where we want, want to solve. And hopefully our example 
will show us how you can get to that point. So today's our focus is on engineering and simulation. Uh, so here, here are the engineering requirements. So you start with some sort of requirement, right? So connectivity is one of the things, then compliance, so you ensure the electromagnetic compatibility, and then the structural integrity and the thermal magnitude, because these are small products, it's gonna generate heat, right? Nothing comes for free, but how do you wanna, how can you dissipate the heat? So all this has an interaction. I mean, some design that you do for your thermal management may not be good for structural integrity. So you have to, you have to take the whole thing together into account. So we start with a conceptual design uh, and, and Ketia has been used for that part. Uh, so we have our Ketia expert uh, online. So if you have any question, uh, I'll, I'll refer to him probably. Uh, I'll try to answer, but if not, yes, he will, he will chip in. Uh, so, so simulation, we will try to come up with a functional generative design, which is, uh, uh, so which basically will look at many different design uh, solutions and uh, depending on your constraint and certain certain uh, objective it will it will tell which design probably will work so you have you will start with with some design that you believe is going to work and then we are going to modify and, and and do some changes in that design depending on more and more intricate analysis but uh, and it follows sort of how na in nature the things the design develops over the years so we do also a webinar on 3d um, uh, 3d printing so there is this functional generative design is a very important mass well. so that's something maybe in the future you can as you can see even now it's getting related so 3d printing is now giving you the liberty to come up with any design configuration because you can always manufacture it so there are different variants of conceptual design then you will you will come with you will select one design and move forward and make start making changes in that design and finalize it so it's the initial stage that we'll start with uh, so i think uh, this one will talk about the electromagnetic simulation part of it so i will hand it over to you now from resource systems uh, hi uh Kanis? yes arindam uh, uh, yeah transfer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you for your presentation. Uh, so Eno is here with us and uh, Arindam, if you could stop sharing your screen yes. and Eno can uh, start sharing his screen. Yep. I am trying. Okay. Is it still sharing? Yeah, from Zoom you have to stop sharing. Okay, no, it's, I can see Eno's you know, screen now. Okay, yeah, we can see Eno's you know, screen. Okay. All right, Eno, you're uh, all set to go. Okay, so um, good day, everyone. Um, during this part of the presentation, we're going to be talking about um, antenna design and placement. So that, that's going to be our focus for this part. So when we think of a wireless device, um, such as the Beamy that uh, we've been talking about, um, what's really the most important aspect of um, design for such a device? Well, it is the wireless connectivity, um, because without wireless connectivity, essentially, um, this device would be useless. I mean, um, in order to properly design um, this Beamy device, it needs to connect um, via Wi-Fi to your home Wi-Fi, and then through the internet to the cloud, for instance, or it could connect um, via Bluetooth to your mobile device, such as a cell phone or a laptop, which would then connect uh, via a cellular network or via Wi-Fi um, to the cloud. So either way, you need to make sure that um, this device is uh, properly wirelessly um, connected. And when we're talking about wireless connectivity, I mean, what is the, the most important thing? Antennas, because um, without antennas, you don't have any wireless um, connectivity. So there are two fundamental questions um, we need to keep in mind when thinking of um, antenna design for such um, a device like the BME. So first, um, how can we keep up? So in terms of uh, antenna design during uh, a dynamic product design cycle, and then um, the second question is uh, how can we explore options um, early? So essentially concepts for future um, communication standards, because you know these are continually um, changing. 
Right. So if we look at the um, the structure of uh, the BME that we're going to be looking at, we can see what the different components are um, within. So essentially what we have here is a projector unit, and we have two battery packs as shown. We have our high definition speakers that are also um, built in. We have our electronics uh, PCB board, which actually contains a, a lot of like the control circuitry as well as maybe some of um, the RF circuitry too as well. So, and then we have our aluminium frame, which actually holds everything um, together. So these are like also the major components um, of our BME. So in terms of uh, the metal frame, if we look at the initial design of the metal frame, we would see that it was designed um, in such a way that we didn't have any space um, to actually install the antennas. So um, this design uh, had to be, of course, like uh, modified. And if we look at the second iteration of this design, we see that we were able to come up with a design um, with enough space to um, actually install the antennas uh, within. However, um, we had to modify this design basically um, to come up with a design that would be easier um, to manufacture. So that was um, changed to a CNC machined frame, which is shown on your top um, right corner. And then um, also this needed to be further um, enhanced to a um, lattice uh, frame as shown on the lower um, right corner. So finally, this was a frame that um, was resolved. Um, so, uh, so that's the frame that was used um, in this case. So. Right. So if we look at all the different um, iterations of frames here, we can see what the possible locations for antennas are. And this is based on the available space that we have uh, within the frame. So how can antenna engineers now um, adjust to this kind of change in um, design constraints? So in order to discuss this, uh, we have this uh, brief agenda we're gonna follow. So first we're gonna look at early stage antenna selection and design, and then we'll move on to um, antenna placement workflow. So we'll see how you typically go about um, installing antennas on such, um, on such a device. And then we'll move on to looking at some result analysis. And then at the end, we'll discuss some um, responses to um, design changes that could occur during uh, the design cycle. All right. So typically, um, when we decide on installing like an antenna on a, a platform such as the BME here, we usually have two choices. So we can either get an off the shelf antenna, so essentially purchase an antenna from um, an antenna manufacturer and then just stick it on the device and um, maybe do simulation or um, do some measurements. But then um, we can also design our custom antenna. So an antenna specifically designed um, for the particular platform of interest. So there are pros and cons um, to each approach. So if we think of the off-the-shelf antenna approach, um, the pros uh, for this are it's, it's a quick development cycle because you don't actually have to design the antenna. You're just buying it and sticking it in. Um, so it's easy to source and plan. However, the cons of um, this approach are um, it's a black box. So in most cases, the antenna uh, vendor won't give you any information about um, the internals of um, the antenna, what's inside um, this black box. So essentially, if, this, if the antenna doesn't work as it's supposed to, um, you're essentially stuck. And so this is really a big con of um, using um, this, um, this kind of approach. Now, if we think of like um, a situation where we're designing a like custom um, antenna for our platform, um, the pros to this is, you know, you have full control and knowledge of the antenna. Um, so you can actually do modifications like on the fly to actually get this antenna to perform um, the way you need it to perform on the platform, especially when you get, when you're, um, 
when you're installing this on a metallic platform because um, in a case like that, the entire platform essentially becomes an antenna. So, um, so you actually have to make sure that this antenna is like properly designed. Um, and then the cons to this um, approach are it requires design. So, um, so if uh, if let's say the engineer doesn't have um, any design knowledge, it could be a little bit um, it, it could be a little bit of a cumbersome uh, approach. However, within the Simulia set of tools, we have um, a tool that's called Antenna Magus, which makes the design process, if this approach um, is chosen. Um, a lot easier, and we're going to talk about antenna makers um, in the next slides. All right. So, for the beamy in general, um, the requirements are it needs to um, support WLAN 2.4 gigahertz and also uh, Bluetooth connectivity. So now the question is, which antenna um, do we choose, um, which can support um, these two um, different standards? So within Antenna Megas, we could easily um, go in and select um, an antennas based on uh, antenna specifications. So the first specification we could select is a specification for smart devices and mobile um, communications. And then what Antenna Megas does is it narrows down to um, what kind of smart devices um, we're talking about. So in this case, we're going to select WLAN. And then it narrows down into the different kinds of uh, WLANs, and we could select um, the option that we want. And the next step, what Antenna Megas does is it goes into its database of antennas, which is a very comprehensive um, database, which is um, currently available. And it searches that database to find the antennas that satisfy um, the key keyword criteria it came up with based on the WLAN 2.4 um, specification. So the keyword criteria that came up with uh, for the WLAN specification were um, compact, integrated antennas, and WLAN. So it narrows down to these um, 33 different um, antennas as we're showing um, over here. And then we could further customize the search criteria for the antenna. So let's say um, we could type in a keyword for instance, omnidirectional. So we want this antenna to be omnidirectional, of course, because you want this beamy um, device to be able to radiate um, in all um, directions. So if, let's say, your mobile device, which is connecting like to this beamy, is at a, a certain at any angle, like within a room, it's able to uh, able to communicate um, effectively. So, um, so we'll type in that keyword. And then um, another criteria we could select here is um, we could specify a space constraint for the antenna. So in this case, a space constraint of 10 by 10 by 20 millimeters was selected. And we're going to see how the space constraint is used. So once we type in the omnidirectional um, keyword um, criteria, we see that what uh, Antenna Megas does is it now narrows the selection from 33 antennas we had before to 22 um, antennas. And so now what we can do is we can now go ahead and try to look for the antennas that um, um, are most suitable for this particular application and place them in a collection of um, antennas. So we can look at the first antenna here, inverted F antenna. Uh, we can see what the characteristics are right on the fly. So, um, for instance, the polarization for this antenna is linear. It's omnidirectional, as um, as we um, requested. Um, the gain, typical gain, 4 dBi, uh, performance bandwidth about 7%. And then we can look at a second antenna here, which is a substrate mounted. Um, normal mode helix, and we look at the characteristics of what the antenna is, and um, then we can also look at a printed meandering uh, monopole antenna, and we can see what the characteristics are for that antenna. Now, as I mentioned, we'll, the next step is we'll place all our prospect antennas into um, a collection of antennas, as you can see. And once we place them into this collection of, ante of antennas, now we can investigate um, each of these antennas um, separately. 
if you remember previously, we had this, we had defined a space constraint for our antenna, and this space constraint is of course defined based on the space we have available on our platform, which in this case is um, the frame of our Beamy um, device. So now with the space constraint, we can visually see um, if the antenna that uh, we chose is able to fit within um, the space constraint. So as shown on the left side here, we can see that um, for this antenna, this meandering antenna, um, it's, yeah, it, the, the, the radiating part of this uh, fits within um, the designated area. However, on the left hand side, we can see that um, this antenna doesn't uh, fit within um, the designated space. However, it performs um, very well at the um, frequency of interest. So what we can do is um, for the antennas that don't satisfy um, the space criteria, we could actually do some modifications to the antenna to try and get them to, um, to uh, fit within the space uh, criteria. So for example, in a case such as this, what we could do is we could um, increase the permittivity, so from default four to um, let's say six, and um, just to, so by increasing the permittivity or relative permittivity, essentially what we're doing is we're um, um, reducing the size of the antenna. So we can um, see that once we do that, now the antenna um, or the radiating part of the antenna is actually able to fit within um, our design constraint space. And we can also check the performance of the antenna just to make sure that uh, once we've modified the relative permittivity of the antenna, it still fits within or it still performs as we expect it to perform, as shown uh, when we look at our return loss on the lower um, right corner here, shown. Right. Okay. It's another very nice tool um, that's available within Antenna Makers. This is the um, compare tool where you can actually look at all the antennas like in your collection side by side. So you can visually um, see what these antennas look like with respect um, to each other, which is um, which is very useful when you're trying to do um, antenna placement on the platform. You can also compare um, the performance of the different antennas just to make sure they all satisfy um, the requirements as shown. So. Okay. Now, once we've selected um, a collection of antennas, I would like to uh, investigate the next step, of course, is we wanna install these antennas on the platform. So the typical design workflow for our installment is first, um, we have to get the CAD, which could be a CAD TL, a SOLIDWORKS model, and then um, using um, the CSD powered by approach, this is imported into um, CSD. Then of course, the next step is we need to find uh, candidate antennas, so which we already did using antenna makers. The next step is we, uh, we need to build assembly and evaluate individual antennas in situ. So essentially we'll install um, the antennas on the platform and then see how um, the antennas perform in terms of um, the uh, radiated file field. And then we'll need to find complement combinations um, for the different antennas. And the reason for this, as we're going to see, is so we can get a good coverage at um, all angles. And then next we'll propose a small selection of practical solutions. So if the design space ends up changing, we have uh, these solutions on hand to be able to, um, to, be able to satisfy any um, design changes that occur uh, within the platform. So all of this is connected together um, through the 3DX platform. So within the 3DX platform, we can essentially uh, very easily interchange um, different CADs, for instance, um, different antennas. So, um, and this enables like a quick collaboration within uh, between different design teams. So, uh, so the mechanical engineer can like make a change on the frame and this change is um, easily loadable into um, our uh, CSD. Um, studio suite design space and we can run a simulation, see um, the effects of this change and then um, you know, continue with this loop. So this is um, 
this is uh, all very useful. So. All right. So in terms of uh, the antenna placement setup, so how do we set up a simulation model uh, from these parts? So the approach we have currently is what we do is we um, we import the CAD into um, so we import it from the 3DX platform into the CSD uh, powered by interface as shown. And once this is imported, if we need to, we can do some slight modifications. And the next step is what we're going to do is now we're going to import our antenna, which we had uh, designed using antenna makers uh, from the 3DX platform. So, right. And so now we have our antenna and our uh platform now we can install our antenna where we need to install it on the platform and this is made easy by um anchor points which are already defined on all the antennas designed in um, antenna makers we can now create um simulation projects within csd using what we call uh, the system assembly uh, modeling so the system and assembly modeling um, enables uh, quick interchanging of the different antennas based on these anchor points, which are possible locations of um, the antennas, as well as um, doing different um, simulations um, uh, um, on the fly within CSD. So, all right, so now what we're showing here is like the complete um, CSD model with uh, the antennas installed. All right. So as I mentioned earlier, we have anchor points defined, which makes uh, installment um, easy to do, because uh, all we need to do is just align the anchor points in order to do um, the installment of um, the different antennas. So next, of course, uh, within the CSC interface, what we want to do is we want to uh, check the mesh. So for the platform mesh, uh, one of the main things is we want to make sure that um, we're not snapping the mesh to every fine little detail um, which is not very important and um, the reason is just to prevent to prevent a mesh that's um, prohibitively um, like cumbersome and on the right side we see what the antenna mesh looks like so we see that with a local mesh refinement we're able to resolve the critical features of on the antenna which is um, very very important in getting accurate results um, from the simulation so once we've installed the antennas like on the platform we can see what the overall mesh looks like and what we'll notice here is that on the platform model as i mentioned earlier the mesh doesn't need to be um, um, overly fine and one of the main reasons is we have what's called the PBA meshing, which enables um, this gradient mesh on the structure. And so you're able to have uh, like multiple materials like within a um, mesh cell, which is not available to you if you were just using a staircase mesh. Okay, and for the antenna, which is uh, the most critical part uh, for this simulation, we see that due to the local uh, based refinement, we have a fine mesh and the important parts of the antenna, such as um, the feed of the antenna shown. And so typically, um, when we design our antenna, uh, we typically um, are looking at the antenna in free space. However, when we install this antenna, as I mentioned uh, previously, the behavior of this antenna um, would most likely um, change. The install behavior would most likely change. Again, because when you're dealing with um, a frame, especially if it's a metallic frame, the entire structure essentially becomes an antenna. So, um, so we have to look at the simulation of the entire structure with the antenna um, installed. So we can see uh, the behavior of the antenna in free space, which satisfies our uh, requirement. But then once we install the antenna on the on the BME device, we can see that the antenna is detuned um, in this case. So what we can do here is we can actually um, manually tune the antenna. Um, so what we can do is we can um, design a tuning circuit for the antenna, or we can actually optimize the antenna while installed on the platform. However, um, 
a more efficient approach would be to actually go back to design studio and compensate for the shift um, that we're able to see here. So what we'll do in design studios will actually design the antenna at a frequency lower um, than the actual um, resonant frequency of interest. So what, uh, what we did was like we shifted this by 200 uh, megahertz um, um, to the bottom. But then what we see here is that that shift is actually too much. So what it does is it, um, it shifts the um, resonance um, off to the left. So what we can do now is we can reduce the shift. So instead of 200, we can make it uh, 120 megahertz. And now we see it, uh, it satisfies um, the criteria as we expect. So it's right within um, the resonant band expected. So with this approach, as you can imagine, um, using antenna makers, this is really quick, so you don't have to run um, a full optimization on the full model, which would require um, a lot of computation, because essentially you'd have to run multiple sim simulations for uh, multiple full 3D simulations uh, for the entire structure if you were using that approach. But with the design um, or the antenna makers approach, um, this is pretty straightforward and fast. So. We can also see what um, the electric field is uh, for the antenna. So in this case, we have two antennas installed. So we can see for the um, left antenna, uh, the radiation, and we can also see for the right antenna, the radiation, and so the, the near field radiation. And this simulation took uh, about 11 minutes on a laptop and required uh, 1.2 gigabytes. And this was done with uh, the time domain solver, which is very uh, memory efficient, as you can see. So. All right. And then next now we're going to look at the um, 3D field patterns for both antennas. So one thing we'll immediately notice here is we have um, a non-uniform distribution of the 3D uh, field. So we have like uh, certain directions where we're not going to get um, as good of a radiation. So the antennas radiate fairly efficiently, as we can see from the total efficiency of 85 and 90 percent uh, when matched. But um, there are clear like holes like in the coverage uh, of each uh, one. So what we want to do is we want to uh, be able to fix that so uh, we can get um, good reception at all um, different angles for the same amount of power that's um, emitted by the antenna. So. All right. So in order to investigate that, what we're going to look at is we're going to look at what's called the um, total scan parts. And so essentially what this is is um, where you activate um, each antenna in turn and then record the max. And um, then you're able to get uh, this part, in, which is essentially the envelope of um, your um, far field um, gain for both antennas. So visually, uh, once we do that, we can see um, in what areas we're going to get good radiation and in what areas the radiation is going to be um, very poor uh, or at what angles the radiation is going to be poor. A more numerical uh, figure for this would be what's called the coverage efficiency. So um, of most importance to us is the zero dB uh, coverage efficiency. And the reason why is because the zero dB coverage efficiency tells us how close um, the radiation is to um, um, a perfect isotropic um, antenna radiation. So in terms of the zero dB efficiency, if we look at um, that for this case, we see it's about 57%. Uh, percent. So there's a lot of um, room for improvement here, of course. All right. So now let's analyze the results further. So first, let's look at the um, lattice structure um, of uh, the BME. So we can see what the internals, again, look like here. And then now if we investigate um, the fossil radiation for different um, okay. so for different um, antennas we can see for position one um, we can see what the fossil radiation is for the different antennas at um, position one and what we'll notice again is that um, some um, angles it's good and some it's not and we can look at the fossil radiation for position two at some angles it's good and some it's not and then we can also look at um, the antennas uh, installed close to the PCB and figure out uh, what the radiation 
as um, for this install location. So essentially what we're trying to do here um, in this process is we're trying to find um, a, a complementary um, combination of antenna patterns so we can get good radiation at all angles. So um, we were able to come up with this complementary pattern here for these two different um, antennas. So an antenna installed at um, location one shown at, on the top and an antenna installed on location two. And we can see what the far field patterns are for these two different antennas. Um, so for the top antenna, we can see that in the area shown, we have a um, good coverage, good radiation, and then in that same approximate area for the second antenna, we have four radiation. So now when we look at the total um, uh, scan pattern, we can see here now that um, since we have a complementary, uh, since we have complementary patterns here, now we're able to cover um, the area with four radiation um, that we had like initially. So um, essentially, when we calculate the zero dB coverage now, or coverage efficiency now, we see it's about 85.3%, uh, which is uh, pretty good. So, so lastly, we're going to look at um, responses to design um, changes. So let's say, for instance, um, the battery um, engineers, so the electrical engineers in charge of battery decide to um, change the battery configuration in order to um, uh, produce longer battery life. So essentially the engineer will go into the 3DX platform and would apply those changes. So the question now is how do these changes influence the antenna design? So as we can see here now, um, the battery packs have changed so that they are now larger and they cover more space like um, on the platform. So uh, if we look at a small va battery variant, we would notice that we have several spaces available for the antenna. For the large variant, um, this reduced space uh, availability uh, for the antennas. So we'll go through the same process. This time, we're going to input um, the constraints for the space available for the second um, configuration, and then we'll go through the same process, find um, complementary patterns that are able to produce um, a good coverage efficiency of, in this case, 81.9. Um, and if we compare um, the two different platforms, so um, the first platform with the um, smaller battery and smaller batteries, and then the second platform with the larger batteries, you can see here that the zero dB coverage um, is not as good um, as it was uh, for um, the first case. And so what we might need to do is we might need to further optimize this so, um, so the zero dB coverage is good uh, for both cases. So we need to optimize the location of the antennas as well as maybe the antennas um, themselves. All right, so other design teams are also busy. Um, so essentially we have design teams in charge of electronics design, power and cabling, um, EMC teams, and also um, for the projector unit itself. And um, all of these can be done within um, the Simulia suite of tools. So we have tools for analyzing um, cable shielding. So essentially looking at radiation into the cabling as well as radiation from um, the cabling and how that interferes with other electronic parts, um, such as the antennas, for instance. So, okay. so all of these, of course, add constraints to the antenna designer. And if we think of other constraints, we have aesthetics design, um, structural reliability, which we're going to talk about, drug testing, and thermal management. And so now uh, I'm going to pass uh, the presentation back on to Rindan to talk about structural um, integrity. All right, thanks, Eno. Uh, that was a great presentation. And now we will pass on the control to Arunda. Can you see my slide? Yes, we do. Okay. Perfect. 
Yeah, thank thank you, you know. And how are we doing on time? Can you... Yes, we're running um over pretty okay. short on time. So if we could speed it up, please. Yep. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'll try my best. So so now it comes to the structural integrity, and, and as you can see, there is a flow of how you are gonna design things, right? So once you are looking at all the EMAP stuff and all some initial generative design. Then now you're gonna more do some testing about small little areas that may have a problem, right? Or or how are we gonna manage the thermal uh, part of it? So that will again change some part of the design. But overall, we kind of have a good idea of the design now, right? So moving with that, um, one of the thing is we all know. I mean, drop test. So this is this is an example. There, depending on your product, there may be other design scenarios. So that's something the design team. Uh, will come up with but drop test uh, it's pretty much for any electronic device and uh, small electronic device that's what you are going to do so we will do a virtual drop test and and why virtual is also think of it all way by all creating all these virtual tests is easy to repeat your test and also when you are doing a physical test there is only so much of information ca you can get from putting sensors and all uh, or do a after test inspection but with a virtual test, your in, amount of information, whatever you want to look at, whatever you want to look at, you can set it up that way. And every time you can you, you can go into as deep uh, as you want. So I'm not going to get into the details right now. So there is also a three-point bending test. So this is going to be from usability point of view. So there will be forces and all how this structure is going to behave on that. And it, it again, it all depends on the your functional requirement, how people are gonna misuse the product, I guess, right? So that's a different conversation. So here you can you can see a nice uh, like a structural reliability analysis. So basically, what we are doing, I'll I'll skip the video right now, go to the next slide. Uh, so this is the uh, this is the process composer or eyesight so on 3d experience as a process composer so we have uh, we have developed a drop test design of experience uh, experiment matrix so basically we say okay these are the various scenarios that we are gonna uh, check for and then you you bring in a, it can bring in like a velocity calculator is nothing but like a some sort of formula calculation it gives you the number based on that you do the drop, drop test process simulation where different DS solution products will be used, say, for example, Abacus right now. Uh, so this will give you a box within which this, this structure behavior may be acceptable or maybe some point are not acceptable within the box. Then either we change the box within which the, the acceptability criteria will be, but if that is fixed, then you change the design. So that's the whole concept. So now going into thermal management. Uh, so we'll look into that. So challenges are is this small, right? Everything is happening. Miniaturization is happening everywhere. And so one of the aspect of that is how you are all this, all this heat you are generating. How you wanna, how can you efficiently dissipate that? And now you see the problem is getting very complicated. Like something that may be good for drop test, that particular configuration may not be good for your thermal management, right? Or or you might have to maybe change some materials because of how you want to dissipate the heat and all right or you can put you may need to put some other component so it becomes very difficult to conceptualize in mind so you, you want to be more mathematical you want to be more process oriented and this is where the, the efficiency of using the platform will come in so basic idea is dissipate the heat from the electronics to ensure thermal performance and avoid future failures due to overheating because if you keep on overheating it and it also goes to thermal cycle and all this for start and stop it, it's a problem so you want to first you want to predict how the airflow is going the heat transfer is happening at the component board and the system level and all this and then you want to change your design if if your output of interest maybe maybe how certain temperatures are at certain regions and not satisfied so again, uh, with time in mind, I'm not going to get into the details of this. Uh, so this is an overall CFD workflow. Similar concept. You have the model. Uh, you, you you come up with a computational domain and flow region for the model. So you you have to you have to define your domain within the CFD, uh, and then you do the mesh part of it, and then the scenario analysis. This is very very similar to what we have talked in the structure. This kind of scenario analysis is extremely important. And there are tools available that will help you to come up with scenarios, put the criteria, it will 
it will help you to tell that okay uh, okay do check this and this and this point not every point in your design domain and based on the numbers also there are adaptive boe and all you can keep changing those scenarios so it will try to help you with running minimum simulation to achieve your full understanding of the design space and then you have the job execution process and, and then if needed you have to do an iteration with design change so everything is on the on the same uh, platform everything is together uh, so you, it, it is very easy to keep changing your uh, design and get feedback from your analysis again this is a nice video so i'll probably skip that but We'll, I think we'll share a uh, whole or part of the presentation. I need to check with my team. Uh, but again, I mean, think of your problem and uh, anything related to this or not, come back to us. We are here always to help you out. And if you don't know the answer ourselves, we'll, uh, we'll get, always get to the so get their experts, and we'll, we'll get an answer for you. So having said that, so we have covered all the structural aspect of it, all the electromagnetic aspect of it, all the fluid thermal part of it. So on the closing com comment, uh, so generally product design involves bringing together many disciplines. So always you have to remember that and technologies and experiences together. So that's why you want to use the platform and all the physics based tools are available there. So you don't have to worry about being in the right physics, which is extremely important. So this is just uh, showing the things that we have discussed today. And then the, the compass at the left and bottom is about bringing the physics, collaboration and everything. So I think we are pretty much done. Uh, I kind of rushed through it. So ho hopefully you don't mind because some of you are getting ready for lunch, I guess. Uh, and uh, so with that, uh, I will we'll open it up for question and answer. And then, Tanis, uh, do you want to take over? Yes, thank you, Arindam. That was a great presentation. And uh, we will be taking questions now. So if you guys want to ask us, our team is here to answer any questions. OK, it seems like we have our first question. Uh, does VICE provide antenna design services? So I think I would like to pass that question to Jim, who is our electromagnetics expert. Um, yeah, is uh, Jim online or? He is. Hi, Jim, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. So can you help us with this question? Sure, absolutely. So we do, we do offer design services and antenna design. Um, so that can include any kind of unique design as well as taking into account uh, all the housing effects that uh, Inu presented. Um, that's a key part of antenna design is you know, not just picking something off the shelf and saying, okay, well, I'm gonna get this gain if I plug it in here. Um, you definitely have to take into account all the housing effects, which include loading, dielectric loading, um, far field blocking, um, uh, as well as taking into account all the boundary conditions that go into creating that radiation pattern, uh, which includes induced currents on your housing and additional ground planes, et cetera. So uh, antenna design, just looking at a, uh, just an antenna in free space can be complicated enough, um, but you actually have to take into account all the conditions uh, in its final environment. And that is something that we can do uh, as well as we can facilitate that into uh, a prototype and into testing. Great, thank you for answering that, Jim. Uh, it seems like we have another question. Should an off-the-shelf antenna be simulated in the housing structure? Yeah, so that, that kind of goes back to the before answer. It, it definitely should. Um, my experience with, with off-the-shelf antennas is uh, they can be great. Um, there's some benefits in the fact that sometimes you don't need to do FCC testing with them, um, but you have to study very thoroughly how they tested the antenna um, and the environment they tested it in, if it was done in free space or if it was done uh, against the ground plane, which is the application you're going to use. Um, there are some antenna manufacturers that will share CAD files with you, so you can actually place it into your housing 
and you can use uh, a matching circuit to account for any kind of shifting that might have happened in the natural resonance with your housing. So I think both options are uh, a valid approach, uh, off-the-shelf antennas as well as um, uniquely designed antennas, but it's uh, paramount that uh, off-the-shelf antennas are tested in the environment that you're going to be using the antenna. Okay, thanks, Jim. Uh, okay, any other questions, guys? I see one question about training. Do you provide training services? So I think, um, Arindam, I will yeah, let you yeah. I mean, we do. And also, uh, when you think of training, it, it can be, as I mentioned before, it can be very customized to help you with getting on board with the software, help you with some nuances in your consulting services, or, or we can, I mean, different levels of training experience, people mid career level, early entry. So we can do all sorts of that. So do let us know. And, and most of our trainers, uh, they have both a very strong experience on the software side as well as uh, providing as a consulting services. So they, they also know where, where you are connecting the dot, what is your pain point. So it's not just gonna be how to use the buttons and all, it, should be, it will be more than that. Thank you. Thanks, Arinda. So it seems like one last question I have is about the recording, if the recording will be shared. So I want to tell everybody that, yes, uh, this webinar has been recorded, and we will share it with everybody shortly after. Yeah, and I just want to mention also uh, that if you follow us on our LinkedIn and all, we are pretty active mm -hmm. over there. Uh, so you will be able to see all our webinar, upcoming webinars, and there are also some complimentary training we provide. Um, so, and you will see all the links to the videos and everything. So feel free to follow us on the LinkedIn. Yeah, that's correct. And on LinkedIn, uh, I will list that in our follow-up emails after the webinar. Yeah. All right. So last call for any questions, please let us know. Okay, there are no more questions. So I think we're good to wrap this up. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Eno. Thank you, Arindam, uh, Jim, Glenn. Um, uh, thank you all for your time today. And I hope you guys have a great day. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you. Thank you.